It is the tradition in many congregations that the gospel reading is read right down in the middle where the congregation sits. And the reason for that is because when we read the gospel, we are remembering that God came to dwell with us and among us. And so that's what I've decided to do for today. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as you're able and hear this reading from the Gospel of Luke. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Happy New Year's Eve. I cannot think of a better way than to be with our MDUMC friends and family in worship here together this morning to begin the new year. We're starting a new sermon series today that will last for about three weeks called Beginnings. And in this sermon series, we'll be looking at the beginning of Jesus' ministry through the lens of the Gospel of Mark. We'll be studying Mark all the way through Lent and into Easter. Today, however, we're wrapping up Luke, the Gospel of Luke, as Mary and Joseph have named and baby Jesus, and they are presenting baby Jesus to God at the temple. As today is New Year's Eve, you may be thinking this morning about your New Year's resolutions, maybe setting new goals for the year, maybe adding a few bucket list items to your plans. I know that I've been doing that. I've been reflecting on how I'd like to set my personal goals and my spiritual goals. You know, the usual. Read my Bible more, organize my house, declutter, start exercising more. But the problem with many of these goals is that if I don't improve my character and grow spiritually, there's a good chance that many of these goals won't be met again this year. In the last couple of years, I've done something new. I decided to choose a special word that I was going to live into for the year. I tried to choose a word that would not only help me to build my character, but to grow closer to God. Last year, I chose the word trust. I knew it was going to be a very busy year, and this word has turned out to be a very solid rock for me. There were many times this past year when I was overjoyed. And there were also many times when I felt overwhelmed. But when I turned to God and I rested on that word trust, God has always helped me get through any and every situation. My scripture for the year was trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not rely on your own understanding, Proverbs 3, 5. So this year I've truly learned that I'm much more I'm much stronger and I'm more capable when I trust God in my life and not rely on myself. If you're interested in this concept of choosing one word for the year, there's a really good book called My One Word by Mike Ashcraft and Rachel Olson. I have the book in my Audible library and I'm listening to it again and praying about what my new one word will be for this year. The scripture that Pastor Jenny just read this morning is from Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. When I was studying this scripture in preparation for my sermon this morning, I continued reading beyond verse 24 through verse 40, and there were actually four words that really stood out to me, guided by the Spirit. So I'm not sure if I'm allowed to have four words for the year, but if so, maybe that will be my words for 2024. I want to be the kind of person that is guided by the Spirit in their life and not just guided by my own wishes and whims. So I'm curious what that will look like this year. As we look again at our scripture in Luke, we've just left Mary and Joseph on Christmas Eve with their new baby who they have named Jesus. 
just as the angel Gabriel had instructed them. The shepherds have visited. They found the baby wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger just like the angels said that they would. The shepherds have left and gone back home, and they have shared with others this angel's message of good news for, of great joy that a Savior has been born, the Messiah. But you can imagine the spiritual and emotional toll on Mary and Joseph during this past year. They have faced scandal. Mary's pregnant before marriage. Joseph is faced with the difficult decision to stay with her and to marry her. A virgin pregnancy? I mean, this is highly unlikely in many people's eyes. I mean, Mary and Joseph are a scandal. But in the midst of that tension, they don't hide from God, but instead, unashamed, they live fully into the promise that, this, that their son is the son of God. They have been given a divine mission to bring the Messiah into the world, even though they weren't really ready for the task. They've traveled many, many miles on foot and on a donkey, and here they are, within the first 40 days of their baby's life, they've already traveled from Nazareth to Jerusalem to Bethlehem and back to Jerusalem. They are emotionally and physically exhausted. They've probably spent many long and sleepless and uncomfortable nights. They're finally at their destination in Jerusalem, and they're ready to present their firstborn in the temple, and I'm sure that they are full of questions. They've been blessed with this beautiful baby boy, and they've been chosen to be his parents, but they must be wondering, what is next? How do we raise a child like this? How are we to raise the Son of God, the Messiah? Yet here they are, young, weary, yet they are unashamed and staying faithful to the Jewish laws. They're in Jerusalem at the temple with their new baby boy. Verse 22 says that when the days for Mary's purification required by Moses were complete, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the temple. They were following the Jewish law that every firstborn male should be designated as holy to the Lord. In Leviticus chapter 12, it also says that they were required to offer a sacrifice of a sheep. But if they could not afford a sheep, then they were to offer two turtle doves or two pigeons. The text says that Mary and Joseph presented the gift that was assigned to the poor, a pair of turtle doves. So we know that they were young, they were a very limited means, but yet they were trying to be faithful, even though their journey hadn't been easy. They were here holding new life with future possibilities in their arms. Now some of us remember bringing our newborns to church the very first time. You feel so proud and yet you're really nervous. You're young, you're inexperienced. I was able to witness my own daughter and her husband bring their new baby, my granddaughter Ellie, to church here on Christmas Eve last weekend. I know that they were so nervous. They sat in the narthex just in case the baby would cry during the service. They were nervous about the crowds of people, the cold weather. What do they do if the baby gets hungry? What if they have to leave and go outside? There's so many thoughts running through their heads. So we know Mary and Joseph are feeling many of those things. And we find in verse 25, though, that when they arrive at the temple to present baby Jesus, as we read a little further, we find out that there are two elders there, the prophets Simeon and Anna. Now these two prophets, they've been waiting a lifetime for this moment when they would see the Messiah with their own eyes. And here, young Mary and Joseph have walked into the temple with the baby wrapped in their arms. So let's read a little further in our scripture. Let's look at Luke 2, chapters 25 through 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him into his arms and praised God, saying, 
Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. So it says Simeon was righteous and devout, and he was looking forward to the consolation of Israel. I like the message version of this scripture. It says that he was a man who lived in prayerful expectancy for help for Israel. So he was waiting in prayerful expectation. It also says the Holy Spirit rested on Simeon. And the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he wouldn't die until he had seen the Messiah. So on this day, when Mary and Joseph arrive at the temple, it says Simeon was guided by the Spirit to come into the temple at that exact time. Another translation says that Simeon was in the Spirit, or the Spirit was on him. Had Simeon not been paying attention to the Holy Spirit, he would have missed Jesus in the temple. This makes me wonder, how many times do we miss God? When God walks in, and we don't even realize it. We miss God because we're not allowing ourselves to be guided by the Spirit. Maybe we're not stopping and being still enough to hear that quiet voice of God. Maybe we're not quiet and still enough to feel God's holy presence in the room with us. We don't like to wait. We're a people who like to be moving, filling our time, staying in control, rushing to the next thing. But if Simeon had done that, He would not have been in the temple at the right time to finally see the baby Messiah for himself. He'd waited his whole life to see this child, and now he says he can die in peace. So it says Mary and Joseph were amazed at what Simeon had said about their child. I mean, can you imagine bringing your newborn baby to church, and the first Sunday you walk in, he is scooped up by the oldest person in the room, and they begin praising God that they can now die in peace because they've seen the light to all nations. It must have been very overwhelming and confusing. And yet, what a confirmation to what they already knew to be true about their child. Simeon then continues in verses 34 and 35, where he gives the young parents and the baby a blessing and also a prophecy for Mary. It says, Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Simeon says this child has a destiny, that Jesus is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel. Now, notice that Luke does not say the rise and fall of many, which is a very common phrase, rise and fall, but he writes it very purposefully the opposite, that the child is destined for the falling and the rising of many. We know now that Jesus fell, suffered, and died, and then was raised in glory. We may fall, but in Jesus Christ we also rise. Simeon then prophecies that many people will oppose the child, and then he mysteriously speaks of the pain of a sword piercing Mary's own soul. This must have been a shock to Mary, but we know that Simeon's prophecy was fulfilled many years later when Mary had to watch as wicked men turned against her son, who was all good, pure love. She had to watch him killed on the cross and watch as a sword pierced his side and drained his lifeblood from his body. Jesus did fall, but he rose again. While this had to have been a terrible shock to Mary, Simeon was honest and he was caring enough to tell these new parents the good news about their child as well as the painful news. Simeon was trying to prepare them for the responsibilities of parenthood that were ahead of them, as well as the difficulties and the pain that was also ahead. Now, beginning in verse 36, there's another important character in the story who often gets left out of this story. Her name is Anna, or in Greek it was Hannah. Anna was also a prophet, and like many women in the early church, she had a very distinct role to play. 
Like Simeon, she's also a prophet with the wisdom of age, and she is being guided by the Spirit. The Scripture tells us that she had spent a lifetime in the temple in Jerusalem. She's 84 years old. She's a widow. And she's also been waiting decades for the Savior of the world to arrive. It says that she never left the temple, but she stayed there fasting and praying night and day. At the very moment of the presentation of Jesus, she came into the room praising God. Scripture tells us that she spoke about the child to everyone who had been waiting for the redemption of Israel. Other versions read that she spread the word to all who were waiting expectantly for the freeing of Jerusalem. The people of Israel had been waiting for the Messiah, and now here he was. And because of this prophet, Anna, a very important woman who was chosen to spread the word that the Messiah had arrived, the word becomes public in a way that it hasn't been before. Both of these prophets were guided by the Spirit to not only recognize the Messiah, but to show their support for this child. So many people had waited for him with their hopes and dreams, but now God has arrived to abide with us. With the support of these prophets in the temple, Mary and Joseph now could also be guided by the Spirit to raise this child to become the person that God intends for him to be. In verse 39, it says, when they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, Mary and Joseph returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now we see a similar story for every child that is brought here to MDUMC. Many babies and children are brought here to be baptized and confirmed. Beautiful children who have been created in the image of God. When we witness a baptism or a confirmation, we're called as members of the church to surround the children with God's grace and to pledge our support and care for their parents and to encourage and support the family within our church community. We agree to do that whenever the pastor asks us during a baptism, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? The congregation responds, with God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. This is a wonderful pledge that we make to the children and to the families that come in and through our doors. Just less than a week ago, we were given the greatest gift that God could have ever given us. God gave us God's self, wrapped up as a baby in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. This baby named Jesus, presented at the temple by his parents Mary and Joseph, would grow up to be the savior of the world. And through this baby, all of us are offered the gift of salvation and eternal life. When we allow ourselves to be guided by the Holy Spirit, just as Simeon and Anna were that day in the temple, we become aware of God's presence among us. When we slow down and when we listen, we're able to hear that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit guiding us toward a deeper relationship with God. As we go into the new year beginning tomorrow, I wonder what your one word will be. I encourage you to pray about it, to read scripture, and see if God will guide you into choosing a word that can be a guide for you in 2024. Maybe your one word will be trust, maybe guidance, thankful, gratitude, mission, servant, Or maybe one of our Advent words of hope, or peace, or joy, or love. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you toward your one word. Write it down, post it on your bathroom mirror, on a sticky note in your car, and just pray about it, live into it, and see how God can speak to you and reflect on that one word. 
Allow God to use that one word throughout your life this year to help transform you into being the person God is calling you to be and who he's calling you to become. May we be the kind of people who live their lives guided by the Spirit and open to new beginnings. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.